For a hundred thousand years, humans have looked up at the night sky and wondered about those awesome points of light. What are they? What are they made of? How did they get there? They didn't have the technology to find out, so they guessed that magical beings had created it all. If you prefer making wild guesses instead of using observation, measurement and calculation, then here's a sealed box. Spend the next 10 minutes guessing what's inside and come back again at the end of this video. Because this video doesn't cover what we guess about the universe, but what we know, and more importantly, how we know it. How do we know where the stars and galaxies came from and how old they are? The first person to take a stab at gauging the scale of the world around him was the Greek scientist Eratosthenes of Cyrene. He knew that on the longest day of the year the sun was directly overhead at Syene in the south of Egypt but cast a shadow in Alexandria to the north. By measuring the length of the shadow he could work out the Earth's diameter. But while the Earth might be spherical, the dogma of a fixed Earth still held sway, backed by a powerful church. Problem was, this didn't fit the observable evidence, especially the observation that some wandering stars, or planets in Greek, had very erratic orbits around the Earth. When the telescope was invented, these planets turned out to be very different to the fixed stars. But it wasn't until Johannes Kepler calculated the exact orbits of the planets that a model of the solar system at last fit the observations. His law of planetary motion turned this into this. In the 18th century, a transit of Venus across the Sun, timed at opposite ends of the Earth, made it possible to calculate the exact distance of the Sun, and by extension the distances of all the known planets. But that still left the stars. The easiest way to measure their distance is a system called triangulation, which is used to measure distant objects on Earth. With stars, the baseline is the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Take an angle measurement here, and six months later here, and just do the math. This principle was known in the 17th century, that their instruments simply weren't accurate enough to measure such a tiny angle. But in 1838, the technology had caught up. The Prussian astronomer Bessel found that the binary star 61 Cygni was an astounding 60 trillion miles away. It was a distance so huge that it had to be measured in terms of the number of years it took light to cross it, 10.3 light years. Our universe just got bigger. Triangulation only works for stars up to 100 light years away, but it was a start. Knowing the distances of these stars, astronomers could work out the relationship between a star's distance and its brightness, because closer stars are generally brighter than distant ones. Using this calculation, they could now estimate the distance of the fainter stars they could see. It was only an estimate, but our universe got bigger again. We seemed to be on the edge of a huge wheel of stars in space. While the brightness of a star gives us an estimate of its distance, confirmation comes in another trick of triangulation. In 1987, a star was seen to explode inside our galaxy. The exploding star is called a supernova, and it's very bright. As it happened, this particular supernova was surrounded by a huge gas cloud far out into space. The light from the exploding supernova raced across the gap, and eight months later, it hit the surrounding gas cloud. Cosmologists saw the reflected glow. We know the speed of light, so we know how far it can travel in eight months. And that means we know the distance between the supernova and the gas cloud, all cosmologists had to do is measure the angle between the two as seen from Earth and once again it's simple triangulation. We can work out the distance of the supernova, 169,000 light years. That means we're looking at an event that happened 169,000 years ago. Our universe was now huge. By simply observing and measuring, we'd calculated a scale in time and space that was far greater than Bronze Age people ever imagined. But one question still confounded scientists. What are all these stars made of? To understand the evidence, we have to understand the atom. There are around 92 different types of atom known as elements. They differ in the number of electrons, protons and neutrons they have. When an atom emits light, it absorbs the light of particular wavelengths. Each element absorbs a different set of wavelengths. 
we can see these absorption patterns as lines when we look through an instrument called a spectroscope. This one shows the spectral lines of three elements that were very familiar to early 19th century scientists, hydrogen, lithium and oxygen. But when the French astronomer Pierre Janssen pointed a spectroscope at the Sun in 1868, he found a set of spectral lines no one had ever seen before. It was a completely unknown element. He called it helium, after the Greek word helios, the Sun. The new element also showed up in stars, along with another abundant element, hydrogen. But inside this tightly bound universe, which they called the galaxy, astronomers could see strange swirling clouds through their telescopes. Some astronomers thought these could be other galaxies just like our own. In 1917, a supernova was seen to explode inside a cloud called Andromeda. Supernova are usually very bright, but this one was quite faint. Using the brightness and distance calculation, cosmologists work out just how far away Andromeda was. Two million light years. That put it well outside our own galaxy, and triangulation showed just how big it was, about the size of our own galaxy. The universe, it turned out, extended well beyond our own cluster of stars and millions of years back in time. American astronomer Edwin Hubble soon discovered that other galaxies were even further away. He also confirmed an observation that they were all moving away from us at incredible speed. Those furthest away were going the fastest. In other words, our universe was expanding, as if we were caught up in a huge explosion. How do we know this? I'll explain with a more prosaic example. When you watch a car speed pass, sounding its horn, the pitch seems to change. As it's coming towards you, the sound waves are bunched up, so the horn seems to have a high pitch. As it passes by, the pitch suddenly drops, because now the sound waves are being stretched out. This is called the Doppler effect. Just by measuring the change in pitch, an observer can calculate the speed of the car and whether it's coming towards him or moving away. We can do the same with stars and galaxies, using light instead of sound. If a galaxy is moving away, the spectral lines will shift towards the red end of the spectrum. The opposite happens if a galaxy is coming closer, they move towards the blue end. So cosmologists could not only calculate which direction the galaxies are moving, but also their speed. If we reverse the course of these galaxies and wind the film back, space itself contracts back to a single point just under 14 billion years ago. The start of this expansion is called the Big Bang. That's as far as we've got so far in our understanding of the scale and time span of the universe. Research is now continuing to discover what happened before the Big Bang. Now let's come back to that sealed box. To the people who decided to skip the video in order to speculate on the contents, have you figured out what's inside yet? Of course not. Sitting in an armchair and making wild guesses tells you nothing. You're really no better off than the Bronze Age farmers who looked up at the stars and tried to guess what they were. Just because the Big Bang is the current extent of our knowledge doesn't mean we've reached the end of the story. Every time in history people thought they knew the scale of the universe, they've always been proved wrong. To me, the real story of the universe is way more interesting than myths and fairy tales. For 100,000 years, humans have stared up at the same night sky and wondered. We are the first people in human history not to wonder, not to guess, but to know. In part one of this video, I looked at our growing knowledge of the universe and how humans became aware of its scale in time and space. Now I want to explain what that knowledge tells us about how our universe unfolded, how the stars and galaxies formed, and how the Earth was created. Not by magic, but by physical processes we know and understand. Our universe, which may be one of several in time and space, started with a huge explosion of energy and matter called the Big Bang. Neutrons, protons and electrons rode in the wake of an expansion of time and space itself. 
After 380,000 years, the universe had cooled enough for these particles to come together to form the first atoms. Nearly three quarters of them were simple hydrogen, just one proton and one electron. 28% were helium, which has two protons, two neutrons and two electrons. Cosmologists thought this cloud of matter must have been patchy, denser in some parts than others. Otherwise, the denser parts couldn't have come together later to form stars. Based on the state of our present universe and theoretical models of the Big Bang, they predicted what this patchy early universe would have looked like. Denser clouds are always a few millionths of a degree warmer than the emptier parts of our cosmos. So cosmologists knew that if they could look back 13 billion years, they should be able to see the heat imprint of these early clouds of particles they'd have to find background temperatures from the universe's furthest reaches. The instrument that achieved this was NASA's Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. It spent two years collecting data from 13 billion light years away, which meant it was not only looking deep into space, but also 13 billion years back in time. Then in 2003, the picture was ready and the world caught its first glimpse of our universe at birth. What you're looking at is a picture of our universe just 380,000 years after it was born, as the first atoms were being formed. It's like seeing the photo of an 80-year-old man just 19 hours after his birth. The red areas are warmer clouds of matter, the blue areas colder and emptier. Hydrogen and helium, protons and neutrons, drifting in a dark cosmos. The Wilkinson probe results were hailed as a scientific breakthrough. They matched the predictions perfectly. Over millions of years, gravitational attraction pulled many of these denser clouds of matter closer together. And the more dense they became, the greater the gravitational attraction. Just as a spinning skater spins faster when she pulls in her outstretched arms, each swirling cloud began to spin until they became tight balls of rotating gas. Inside each ball of gas, the pressure increased. Whenever a gas is compressed, it heats up. So hydrogen atoms in the center of the cloud started vibrating faster and faster until they were crashing into each other at such high speed, they began to fuse to form helium. Each nuclear fusion reaction is accompanied by the release of energy. The energy makes other hydrogen atoms vibrate even faster, fusing more of them, releasing more energy that fuses more atoms, and in a split second, a chain reaction. Like trillions of hydrogen bombs exploding at once, the ball of gas ignites. The first stars illuminate the cosmos. Early swarms of stars were also drawn together by gravitation, forming galaxies. The first stars burned for billions of years, powered by fusion. But a star has only so much hydrogen fuel. As the energy is used up, the star begins to collapse, pulling the gas ball tighter. Pressure and temperature increase until they're high enough for helium atoms to crash together and fuse. This makes heavier atoms, like carbon and then oxygen. With higher temperatures and pressures, even these atoms fuse until the star becomes a white-hot factory. The energy from these reactions is far greater than the fusion of hydrogen. Finally, the temperature and pressure are so high that the star explodes, spewing its contents into space. Often the shock waves throw these heavier elements against clouds of hydrogen and helium that have been dormant in space for billions of years. This cloud hadn't been dense enough to pull together under gravitation, but the sudden jolt from the exploded star stirs it. Now gravitation starts to pull the denser areas closer together. The life cycle of a star begins again. Only this time, things are different. 
This time, the cloud of gas is laden with heavier elements. Thanks to spectroscopy explained in part one of this video, we can measure the proportion of the different elements in stars and in our own sun. Because stars have been forming since our universe began, we can see them in all their different stages of development, from their inception to birth, maturity, old age and death. So we know the rate at which hydrogen and helium fuse. The proportion of the two elements tells us the age of the star. Our sun is about halfway through its life cycle, which makes it about five billion years old. So five billion years ago, a nondescript cloud of gas must have come together in this way and formed a medium-sized, rather nondescript star on the edge of a very ordinary spiral galaxy. As it formed, the heavier elements in the cloud created rings of dust in orbit. Over time, these came together under gravitational attraction to make tiny rocks, then larger rocks, a process known as accretion. This isn't an extraordinary process. In our tiny corner of the universe alone, cosmologists have detected hundreds of planets, so there could be billions of them in just our galaxy. Some would be too close to a star and water would boil away in the intense heat. Others would be too far and water would freeze. But for any planet in an orbit between those two extremes, water would be liquid, just like on Earth. Within a few hundred million years, accretion had created a huge ball of rock that would become our planet. At first, it was molten because of the energy of millions of collisions. Then the molten ball began to cool and a hardened crust formed over it. A few million years after it formed, the Earth was cool enough for water to condense and over the next billion years, chemical reactions created replicating molecules that would one day evolve into simple cells.